My name is David Hartnett. and I'm the Vice President of Metro Atlanta Chamber. I specialize in bioscientists and health IT economic development. I'm on the board of Georgia Bio and this is our signature event. We're very pleased to be here. Georgia Bio does an outstanding job. They're the leading trade organization in Georgia and we bring the brightest and best to the conference to highlight all the wonderful things that are going on in Georgia. What a great conference. It is quite an honor to be chairman of Georgia Bio. My name is Tom Calloway, and uh, I would greatly like to thank the uh, incredible committee, including the leadership of John Richard, who put together a fantastic summit. I hope you're enjoying it. Thank you so much. But financially, this would not be possible if we did not have the deep pocketed and long-term support of our champion sponsors. And I'd like to name them if you don't mind. And if you are a member or a part of the organization of one of our champion sponsors, if you would stand for a minute, because I want you to be recognized. I would like to thank Arbor Pharmaceuticals, Dendrion, Emory University, Georgia Research University, Georgia Tech, Georgia State University, Kilpatrick Townsend, King & Spaulding, Piedmont Healthcare, Sutherland, UCB and the University of Georgia. These are the organizations that have allowed us to continue to thrive. Thank you so much for your efforts. Now I want you also to recognize that there is a great opportunity to be involved with the 2014 summit. If you look at the back of your uh, program, you'll see that there is a discounted sponsorship, 10% off sponsorship for next year. So I want you to just consider that uh, as well. Um, this has been a, uh, this is my last summit as chairman and it has been a uh, uh, exhilarating ride and I've greatly enjoyed working with an exceptional executive committee working through a lot of challenges and I especially would like to thank my vice chair Ed Shutter who next year will be standing at this podium as your chairman of Georgia Bio. So Ed, thank you for all your help in putting things together. But finally, this year has been exceptional because we have recruited uh, a fantastic talent from the state of Florida uh, who has come and has reinfused our organization with a new vision, a new direction, added leadership and organization. So I'd greatly like to thank Russell Allen for his contribution to our organization this year. Thank you, Russell. So next I'd like to recognize one of our champion sponsors who has been the glue, has been part of our community for over 20 years. Uh, the Georgia Research Alliance, you probably know because they are critical in recruiting faculty uh, to the state of Georgia from other areas uh, as eminent scholars into our universities. These faculty are attracted because they are allowed to not only spend their time doing academic research, but also commercializing their technologies. And a lot of Georgia's startups, as you know, have come from this uh, uh, group of eminent scholars who've then taken their technologies and formed young companies. The GRA has expanded its mission, however, from just the idea of working with faculty to including supporting these young companies as they go through the valley of funding death. Um, but most importantly, I want to recognize the fact, the role that GRA plays in uh, breaking down the silos between our institutions. You know, the best science is always at the intersection of technologies, of different types of disciplines, you know, biomedical engineering and regenerative medicine, uh, things like nanoparticles and diagnostics technologies, or animal sciences and their relationship to vaccine development. These are the things that the Georgia Research Alliance puts together scientists, puts together institutions, and allows them to collaborate. So as a result of that, Georgia is a better place. Our universities have a more vibrant academic community. We're attracting top PhDs to come and study with us and do their postdocs. And also, we're beginning to create jobs in our important industry of the life sciences. So I would like to thank GRA for that. But also, I'd like to thank GRA and invite Lee Heron up to say a few words because they are the sponsors of our lunch. Lee, thank you for coming up. Well, thank you, Tom, and just uh, a few brief words. Um, it's my pleasure to represent the Georgia Research Alliance at the summit. As many of you know, the GRA is a not-for-profit company. Uh, we're actually in our 13th year of existence, but we are actually operate in a partnership with the state, the state's research universities, and the business community. And we help build bridges between those three. Um, 
Our mission is to increase the research capabilities in the state and in doing so to, to lay the foundation for and provide support for uh, long-term economic development. We do this primarily through the creation of startup companies. Um, we're very proud supporters of Georgia Bio and appreciate all the work it's doing for the life sciences community in the state. So thank you, enjoy your lunch and the, and the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. It is such an honor to, uh, excuse me, it's such an honor to have the president and CEO of Quintiles Trans Transnational, John Ratliff here, to give us a few moments and a few words about Quintiles. I'd like for you to think, though, for a minute about Quintiles. Uh, Quintiles is interesting because it is the largest medical contract research provider in the world. Uh, and they have been involved with the approvals of about 50 blockbuster drugs that are currently in the marketplace. I don't know if you saw in the news recently that Merck is laying off 8,500 people, mainly their R&D and clinical development groups. Uh, and we would ask ourselves, what's happening to this industry? I would argue that it's beginning to transform itself because we're beginning to learn that there are services in the entire pharmaceutical spectrum of development that are available from companies such as Quintiles. We think of them probably as a clinical trials organization, but in fact, if you don't know, they have spun off separately now a, uh, a venture capital group with about a half a billion dollars of investment to go into the biopharmaceutical space. Uh, they can do your preclinical work for you in animal models. They can do your clinical studies for you. They can get you through the FDA process or through the European regulatory agencies. And then if you're ready to commercialize and you need a sales force, they've got that. In fact, in this world of changing healthcare systems, they have some of the leading health economics groups that can help advise you as the cost effectiveness of your, or of your studies. So. But it's also interesting that when Dennis Gilling started his organization, he called the company Quintiles Transnational. Transnational, a very global company with a global vision. It takes a big idea to develop a big company like that. Um, interesting now, it is about a $4 billion company from that vision. Um, the other thing is if you're going to run a global company, then uh, you need to start thinking about centralizing services and providing data in a centralized way. Uh, I am pleased to say that Quintile's global laboratories for North, Amer North and South America is based right here in Marietta, led by J.J. Spiegel. And J.J., we're delighted to have you here and be a member of our board. Uh, so you, you might ask the question, why did Quintile's, even at the beginning when they were starting, decide to put their centralized laboratories in Georgia. So the question is, why Georgia? Well, it's kind of obvious. It's in two words, and to borrow a slide deck from Delta, and to use some words from our other big company, UPS, it's logistics, dummy. The ability to take a sample of a specimen from a person in Chile and get it delivered to America, the place where it's most likely going to enter the United States is Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm delighted they decided to do that. Um, and also, it's interesting, I was talking to JJ, we are also the specialized laboratory for the world. If there's something unusual like a mass spectrometry, uh, it's, it's where we might get the assay tested. So we're delighted to introduce you to John Ratcliffe, the president and COO of Quintiles. Uh, it's, also, it's interesting, he joined the company in 2004, shortly after the company was taken private by Texas Pacific Group and a bunch of other private investors. But they ran the company very efficiently, growing it from $1.3 billion to almost its $4 billion in revenue today. He also became president and, and uh, chief operating officer in 2006 uh, and helped lead them through their organizational changes to become a publicly traded company here in 2003. Interestingly, the growth of the company has been exceptional, about 10% a year with, with the margins increasing year after year, probably because companies like Merck are looking more and more for out, outsourced resources. Uh, I'm also pleased to let you know that John is one of our own. He is from West Virginia, but instead of deciding to go to Virginia Tech to be an engineer, he decided to come to the big city of Atlanta and go to Georgia Tech, where he got his bachelor's degree in industrial and systems engineering. Uh, and then he went to my alma mater, Duke, to go get his Fuqua MBA. Uh, John, we're delighted to have you, and welcome. We look forward to hearing your comments. Thanks so much. Great to be here. As uh, Governor Deal said, you know, get those flu shots. 
You're going to hear my deep, sexy voice right about now, and it's because I have a little bit of that bug. But instead of getting that flu shot, my uh, friends from Baeta would say, have we got a clinical trial for you? So please, if you've got something, just go out the door. We'll hand you a flyer, try to get you into the clinical trial that we're partnered with. Um, good afternoon. I'd really like to thank you for this opportunity. <clears throat> I'm going to give you that from my view of innovation in life sciences. I'm going to talk about the perspective of pharmaceutical innovation, specifically from at least my vantage point as president and COO of Quintiles. Quintiles provides global product development, commercialization, and even real-world research services to pharma and biopharma companies. We have 27,000 employees in 100 different companies. And yes, 800 plus even here in Atlanta. Uh, we just did and completed a billion dollar IPO in May and so now out on the public markets. My colleague, JJ, clearly has been leading our efforts down here in Atlanta. And he's the head, he's the vice president of our central labs and heads up our Atlanta operations. We have others in the crowd. We have a table full down front. And I, I'll just say a couple of names. Dr. Diane Fari, who's our medical director. Uh, Dr. Linda Robbie, our head of assay development and others. And they basically came here to make sure I got this right. Um, Atlanta, as Tom talked about, is a perfect environment for quintiles. When you look at the major academic infrastructure, when you look at the trained, talented, skilled, knowledge workforce, is perfect for a company like Quintiles. When you add to that really the excellent health business climate that you have here, and in addition, as Tom talked about, the world-class logistics infrastructure, there couldn't be a more perfect place to have our 800 plus employee base. Quintiles Global Research is basically a network of facilities and experts that actually includes about 800 medics, 850 PhDs, which would put us in the top five teaching hospitals here in the US. We clearly have been involved with either the development or the commercialization of each of the top 50 drugs that are out there on the marketplace today. Now, <clears throat> well, that puts us on the cutting edge of advances in medicine, and its future is absolutely dazzling. Now, I'm going to introduce you to an individual that maybe many of you know, and I'm going to talk about the future, and I'm going to talk about an individual named Nicholas Selby. <clears throat> and I want to show you a little bit of a video that many of you might have seen and then go from there. We chose Georgia Tech because we want to do the impossible and this school is equipped with the resources and faculty to help us do just that. And so, in the words of Sir Isaac Newton, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Georgia Tech is proud of its many traditions, but the one I find most exciting is our tradition of excellence. Our mission as students is not to follow in the footsteps of the astronauts, Nobel Prize laureates, and president who graduated before us, but to exceed their footsteps, crush the shoulders of the giants upon whom we stand. We here are all such innovative people, so I am telling you, if you want to change the world, you're at Georgia Tech. You can do that. If you want to build the Iron Man suit, you're at Georgia Tech. You can do that. If you want to play theme music during your convocation speech like a badass, we're at Georgia Tech. We can do that. I am doing that.
for all you Bulldog fans out there. Don't hold that against me. <clears throat> but it was good to see this uh, message go viral just recently. And if you hadn't spotted him on YouTube, Selby is a Georgia Tech engineering student, and he gave this convocation address just recently at our freshman orientation. But as Selby said, Georgia Tech students means you can do the impossible. And I'm with Selby. I want to do the impossible. His enthusiasm is exactly what I want to share with you about the adventure ahead in life sciences. Now, I won't be playing the theme from 2001 Space Odyssey in the background. But you can hear it in your head now, can't you? And that's exactly the soundtrack for the biomedical wonders that are in store. Nothing less than a therapeutic revolution that is ahead of us. Now, the present is tremendously challenging. You know, today's medical innovation is based on twin revolutions in genetics and information technology, and a large part of that is about reinventing the drug development process. And the future this innovation is creating is mind-boggling. When you look at what is ahead of us, we must buckle our seat belts and making basically a Star Wars jump into hyperspace. We don't have a spaceship, but what we do have is a clinical trial. Now, if you ask people what's the greatest medical innovation and invention of the 20th century, most people will say penicillin, polio, the actual antivirals that made AIDS a chronic disease instead of a death trap, and statins that dramatically reduce the risk of heart attack. I'd be surprised if anyone said a clinical trial. But it's the randomized clinical trial that's delivered all of today's therapies, the product of that modern therapeutic revolution. The catalyst was the 1962 kefauver harris Amendment. It required for the first time that drug makers actually demonstrate the proof of efficacy and earn that market approval from the FDA. Starting in 62, the pharma industry, working together with regulators and academics, shaped the modern three-phase drug trial and based it on a randomized controlled clinical trial. Since 1962, that process has actually created 1,130 novel therapeutic drugs approved by the FDA almost all medicines in use today. Take a look at what the therapeutic revolution has meant in our lifetime. This video, I love this video, Hans Rosling's Joy of Stats is a powerful, the tech guys over there at that table love it too, uh, is a powerful visualization of the impact of health advances of the last 200 years in 200 years. Countries. So here we go. First, an axis for health, life expectancy, from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 400, 4,000, and 40,000 dollars. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. 
and eventually the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s, and in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou, it is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you have seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? As Rosling says, 21st century is a new world. It's a great convergence of resources with the power to launch us into an era of new global health. Now it's our turn to act. It's our turn to advance clinical research. It's our turn to deliver amazing new therapies on the horizon, cell therapies, regenerative medicine, gene therapies, bionics, and yes, even in our children's lifetime, anti-aging medicines capable of extending the human lifespan. Now, I'm like Nicholas Shelby. I want to change the world. I want to do the impossible, something epic. The life sciences are ultimately about making human life better, conquering disease, and relieving suffering. Patients are at the heart of what we do, and I want to change the world for the people I love. I have a son that's autistic, Kevin. The governor actually talked about research that is happening right in our backyard that will enable him to be free of that disease. I have a father who suffered from Parkinson's and passed away from it. We're doing clinical trials on Parkinson's and I see the breakthroughs in those rare diseases, such as even last year with Calideco in cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis that is in a first real effective treatment. And I know that that breakthrough for Parkinson's is near. My mom suffered a series of strokes 
and we still treat them with rat poison. We have done and are doing major clinical trials that make for a more effective treatment that will free people that have strokes to have a very, very enabled and robust lifetime. I've been working in life sciences for the last decade and then 20 years before that in technology. Over that time, I've seen a natural and dramatic convergence of genetics and information technology that will accomplish these impossible things. Miraculous innovations are now coming from genetics that give us a deeper understanding of biological systems and causes of disease, from vast data resources that ask and answer complete medical questions using supercomputers and analytics, and from collaborations that are harnessing the science, knowledge, and technology to solve world health problems. Here's what I think it takes to move innovation forward. First, we need a deeper and broader expertise. Innovation is knowledge-based. The author Malcolm Gladwell actually said that no major innovation comes from someone over 35 years old. I'm 34. Actually, that's not true. <laughs> you could probably flip the 35 and get a real close proximity, you know, of where I'm at. And that doesn't discourage me at all. <laughs> it shouldn't discourage you, not for an instance, because medical innovation is different. Medical innovation confounds conventional wisdom because so much expertise and knowledge is required. Now, not only is our medical, biomedical knowledge exploding, but now we're able to connect with the world's experts to work on problems together. Consider the Human Genome Project, a collaboration that concluded with the publication of the genome on the internet delivered a treasure trove of information that will continue to be mined by experts from the CDC here in Atlanta to Singapore. The fruits of the expertise continue to expand exponentially. Take, for example, the recent study of genetics on breast cancer. You even heard some of what we're trying to do here in Georgia today that basically identified four disease subtypes that actually point the way to new therapies and better uses of existing ones. Moving forward, it'll take greater expertise. It'll take joint efforts of the minds across the world to deliver medical innovations that do the impossible. Rest assured, life science industry is delivering, and you don't have to look any further than Atlanta. <laughs> take Chuck who's eating lunch right now. I got used to actually presenting during lunch in an IPO process. Anytime you want money, you've learned to actually present while all you guys are eating out there. Um, Chuck has a deep expertise in the management and reporting of clinical trials that are used to evaluate the safety and efficacy of experimental therapies. Denise Legginsoff has decades of research experience, first at the bench and now leading Quintile's project management organization to conduct hundreds of clinical trials, studies for dozens of drug developers in therapeutic areas from cancer to diabetes. And Dr. Linda Robby, who leads a team of PhDs who've developed over 300 new biomarker assays using a wide range of technologies from molecular to immunoassay. Now, I do believe that it will take precision. <clears throat> By that, I mean the ability to precisely define and address the cure causes of illnesses. Precision is understanding and treatment of disease in driving a new era of medicine. Now, some people call it the era of personalized medicine. I kind of like the idea and and now preferring precision medicine. Personalized and precision medicine refer to the diagnosing of and treating disease based on an individual's genetic profile. No longer is it the 
one-size-fits-all shotgun approach to medicine. It's much more now personalized, sharpshooter approach that tailors a given treatment. This is all about addressing the underlying disease, not just the symptoms. Caladeco, the new cystic fibrosis drug I mentioned, targets a specific mutation of the gene involved in CF. Only about 4% of patients actually have that mutation, one of several that cause the disease. For this lucky subset, the targeted return, the drug returns them to healthy levels of the lung function. These innovations are needed to implement precision medicine in both research and treatment, and they are staggering. New practices for genetic testing, sample storage, diagnostics, and measuring drug effectiveness must be developed. A lot depends on the advancement and the identification and the use of biomarkers. The science is, is really advancing rapidly. In 2000, it cost a quarter of a million dollars to sequence an individual's genome. That now costs about $1,000. Quintiles even bought a company, Expression Analysis, to focus very specifically on genomic sequencing. Soon we'll be able to understand the genetic roles in many diseases, especially cancer. And Georgia is right in the heart of innovation in this precision medicine. You need only to look at the lab that JJ runs, which is playing a leading role in biomarker development. And I know many of you in the audience will be focused on advances in this area. Innovation requires information and especially the ability to turn data into usable intelligence. To borrow a line from Samuel Coleridge, poet, we have data, data everywhere. Now it's time to think. The decade of big data means that vast amount of health data are becoming available to us. And to do everything from building computer models of actual biological systems to tracking real world health outcomes for large populations. The NIH's gene bank has more than 680,000 nucleotides and 600 gene sequences. Kaiser's medical research database holds more than 28 million anonymized patient health records. Companies like our committees are conducting clinical trial simulations using virtual patients modeled on the computer. The Blue Brain, the Blue Brain Project, try to say that five times fast, is building a simulation of the human brain at the molecular level. One of the great challenges for clinical development is to use real-time information to make clinical trials more efficient, more informative, and especially safer for patients. I can speak for my own company as an example of this. We're using real-time data to monitor clinical trials. We have over 60 million patient records, longitudinal data that we use to enable patient penetration, to enable who the best investigators are. We use a sophisticated technology platform called Infosario, which can aggregate and visualize massive amounts of data, thus enabling us to identify problems at study sites, especially potential safety risks, and take appropriate action. To manage the Herculean task of actually implementing advances like these, we need collaboration. No single entity, be it government, agency, university, or pharma has the volume of information, expertise, or financial wherewithal to take the next giant steps in this future alone. Just take cost. Last month, reporter Matt Herper described an analysis conducted by Forbes that actually put the cost of bringing a new drug to market at $5 billion. Now, I've heard more closely widely cited at around one and a half to two billion. 
That's daunting enough, but Forbes took a different look. Its, an, its analysis actually focused on the number of new drugs per investment broken down by company side. The analysis highlighted how the number of research failures drives up costs. Drug development costs are notoriously hard to measure, and analysis like this one are clearly debatable. But what's not debatable is that the escalating development costs put our therapeutic revolution at risk. It will take collaboration among diverse stakeholders, industry, academia, government, health providers and payers to decipher the complex health care ecosystem and figure out which levers to push in order to advance health care at a price society can afford. You know, consider the power of collaboration to solve problems. Not long ago, scientists enlisted gamers to actually create a model of the enzyme from the AIDS-like virus. The spatial skills of the gamers enabled them to produce the model in just three weeks where scientists had failed. Collaborations give us the power to take on enormous challenges. For example, the partnership between Sage BioNetworks and the National Cancer Institute to help build computer models that actually can predict liver, colon, and pancreatic cancer. Full disclosure here, actually Quintiles made an investment in Sage Networks. So I promised you something epic. And yes, EPIC stands for expertise, information, <clears throat> precision, and collaboration. Yeah, it's kind of corny. What did you expect out of a Georgia Tech grad? I'm not a marketing guy from Georgia. I mean, you know, come on. <clears throat> it may sound corny, but hopefully it inspires you to do something epic. We have to have the promise and privilege to take part in the life sciences enterprise. Wherever you work, in pharma, biotech, or the outsourcing industry, in academia, in pharma, in the government, in a caregiver, as an insurer, as a payer, as a provider, you're a pioneer on this emerging life science frontier. It's tough to be a pioneer. There are no clear paths, lots of pitfalls, and lots of dead ends. But picture the sun rising over the rim of a dark planet and let the 2001 Space Odyssey theme play in your mind because that's where we are. I truly believe we have an opportunity of epic proportions if we can innovate successfully. I hope you will join me on that journey in pursuit of the impossible. Thank you very much.